us this evening. Um, welcome to our second Real Business of Wine uh, webcast and thank you all um, our uh, attendees and our panelists for, for showing up. Um, the theme this evening is working remotely um, as it happens the, of the five of us um, four are effectively under house arrest. Um, Polly Hammond, my co-presenter here, um, usually in New Zealand, but now with her daughter in Barcelona, not really able to go very far. Uh, Rebecca Hopkins, um, who we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later on. We've got her, you've seen her biography elsewhere, but has worked for Constellation Wines and now works for with Folio Partners, with producers all over the world, is currently um, grounded in San Francisco. Uh, Camilla Lunelli, who normally is, is moving between various of the Lunelli businesses, which um, includes your, your own wineries, you've got Bizal, you've got a distillery, you've got a water business, and I think you're involved with all of those, but you're also, uh, as I understand it, under house arrest as well. And Laura, you avoided being under house arrest in Buenos Aires or indeed uh, Mendoza, um, to be under house arrest in California, if, I, if I'm correct. Is, is that right? Hold on, I think you're muted. Hold on. Sorry. I can't hear you. Uh, I feel like I'm actually in house arrest in Argentina because that's the only people I'm talking to. <laughs> well, let's kick off. Polly, um, would you like to start to talk to Lara um, now about where, where she's at? Of course. Okay. Um, so I know that Robert has an agenda that he likes to keep too, but my job is always to subvert that. And uh, I actually want to ask you a very specific question about taking care of your family and the routines of life, because you've done this back and forth between two continents for a very long time. And yes, we have businesses to run, but we know that that infrastructure can't happen unless everything is well and coordinated at home. So along with, you know, the great wine information about how we want to run a winery from remote, can you also talk about how you've worked to manage the family and keep normal life happy from far away? Yeah, so I, I call it the philosophy of accepting the B minus. And uh, it means that in certain things uh, you aspire to doing you know, maybe not perfection, but doing very well, uh, like your kids feeling loved by you. Uh, but in other things like having a neat house or, you know, never eating junk food, uh, you accept the B minus, sometimes the F, uh, you know. So um, in terms of how I organize myself, you know, you have to have a partner at home that is willing to work with you. Uh, you invest a lot in a loving babysitter. Um, I don't care uh, if the babysitter you know, cleans or cooks well, or pretty much anything other than that they're a loving person uh, to my kids. Um, and I try to organize things so that actually my kids, you know, when they've been old enough, you know, which means five, uh, can actually remember when to get up and they have an alarm. So, you know, a lot of also independence in your children. Uh, and then, you know, my husband is um, very involved when I leave. However, when I come home, he doesn't want to do anything and I accept that, you know, so when I leave, he's in charge. When I'm there, I'm in charge. And um, anyhow, that's how I've, I've managed by basically accepting that a lot of things are not going to be done very well. Do you feel like those lessons, which are very human lessons, uh, inform how you've handled the medical practice while you were in Argentina and the winery when you were in San Francisco? Well, you know, as a doctor, you can't do a B minus, you know, it's got to be A plus all the time. So, um, you know, that is a little bit stressful because, you know, if my kids call me, I can't really call them back unless it's an emergency. Uh, so, um, but that's something that every doctor, nurse, you know, person that works in a hospital has to deal with, you know, how do you uh, take care of your kids when you're working and somehow everybody figures that out. Um, when I'm in Argentina, it's, I'm very far, so I can't solve a lot of problems. We did have one time, one child that my husband and I both thought they might have meningococcemia, which is a, a lethal illness. And, you know, I had my son helping my babysitter who didn't speak English, trying to take them to the hospital and it turned out to be nothing. 
but it was one of those really sort of horrific experiences that showed me that actually my system worked because um, the kids who were young, but they were older than the one that had the problem, managed to support uh, everybody. And we got to, they got to the hospital and they, we got a call. You know, I was in Argentina at a, at a wine dinner and everybody just went quiet and said, you know, we'll continue the white tasting by ourselves while you go take care of your issue. And somehow the system worked. And so I think that accepting lack of perfection is, is really the key to being able to do a lot of things. And I think we're finding that right now that we're all at home and, you know, pretty much nobody at this moment can do anything that well. We have to accept good enough. And maybe that's a lesson that we will learn for the future. Um, so just one last question, and then I'll let Robert take the floor. Do you feel that there are systems that you've had to put in place, like practical systems, to run Argentina while you were in San Francisco that you could share with us, maybe for some of the wineries in the room? Yeah, so actually right now I'm having to teach my own team to work remotely because they're not used to me to work remotely. And the main issue is communication. So you have hallway conversations in an actual office. Uh, in a winery. Uh, we don't have that. And those are key conversations. So what I do is two, two big things. First of all, I have scheduled calls on specific days at the same time every week, almost like a piano lesson with certain people that happen regularly that are on the calendar. And um, we have a list of topics that we always discuss. So that list is always uh, the list we go to. The other thing is I don't take any calls from anybody without a list of topics that will be discussed. So either, if I'm generating the call, I have to make the list and send it to the other person or the other person has to do that. If somebody calls me without a list, we hang up, we come up with a list and we get back on the phone. Those are my two cardinal rules. Okay, thank you very much. I'll pass to Robert now. So Laura, just one question just to add to that really. Um, the, the difference to me, one of the things about working in an office or in any kind of, of environment where everyone's working, <laughs> hopefully somebody suddenly has an idea or suddenly has an issue and they can call you or they can walk into your office or whatever there and then. Um, and that could be at any time of, the, of, the, of the, the day. The moment we are separated, then you build in the sort of structure you're talking about where you're, we're, we're talking to a particular person at a particular time on a particular day, how does that accommodate all of those um, those unstructured uh, needs for communication? Yeah, so I think that that is a big problem. But the way I've solved it is that since people know that they're going to be able to talk to me, let's say on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, um, they start making a list of all these ideas. And actually, sometimes sleeping on it for two or three days makes you realize that that idea that you thought was brilliant is not that brilliant. So you actually come up with a much better list of ideas. So I think that actually the, the, if you're able to continue communications and you have regular meetings, you are able to be very efficient working remotely. Um, now, I've never done working remotely for three months. You know, I usually see my team every other month. So I, I, you know, I think that at some point you have to see each other but if you're disciplined about making a very good checklist of things to talk about it, you can replace most of the hallway conversations and the creativity. And have you done the, uh, in, in, uh, since we are talking about wine, how much have you done remotely with wine? Have you been sitting there tasting the same wine as other people in the team and other places at the same time? Do you do that? Yeah, so I, I regularly get uh, wines from the team at the winery that we taste. Um, you know, just to taste blends or which direction we're going in. But actually, um, long before what's happening now, I had been doing virtual tastings with journalists. So for example, the, the Parcelas of Adriana, which are five different wines from different parcels, I actually have an online tasting that I send, you know, a certain little kit with the bottles and I schedule a meeting with a journalist. And I have done dozens of those uh, with uh, people all over the world. And mostly because as you know, a mother with young children, I could not travel as much as I needed to for my business. And so I find that virtual wine tastings work incredibly well. That it's, it's really just like being in person as long as both people are tasting the same wine. And no, no issues, no, no, none of those have caused any problems at all. They've all worked 
easily? Uh, well, you know, there is often a problem with the internet. And uh, I have to say that um, I had used a lot of Skype in the past, which does not work as well as Zoom and Teams mm -hmm. that I'm using now. So honestly, this uh, current issue that requires many more people to be online at the same time has actually forced even our own team to get our act together in terms of the internet connection and the technology. And I think that that will be something that we will take away with us after um, the, the coronavirus um, you know, situation is over. Thanks, Sarah. I think what we'll do is I'll, I'm going to move on to Camilla and we'll come back to a lot of these things as we've, as we've all really discussed um, some of them. Camilla, have you, have you done, do you do um, virtual tastings as well? Well, I had one uh, two days ago because they're really booming. Most of all in Italy, since we've been uh, under house arrest, as you as you call it, for uh, a couple of weeks now. So I must say that most of all on uh, on social media, that's really exploding, and uh, it's really rising Eastern interest because people are uh, are staying at home. So and at this time of the day, for us, for instance, they feel like having a glass, and what's better than having that glass? which is presented by the producers. So it's really su successful. This is true for wine as well as for uh, pairing with food. So we're having a boom also of the online recipes going on now. But before this emergency, I must say that we did some experimentation, but uh, I don't think we're as familiar as Laura is with this long-term uh, long uh, remote uh, kind of, of activity. Maybe it's part of also of Italian <laughs> touch, the fact that we try to have as much of a, of a personal contact as possible. And it's not always the case. We had an experimentation a few years ago with some um, virtual tasting on, on Twitter, which were quite successful. But uh, yeah, it's still, I don't think it's as heavy. But the, I still believe in... <laughs> direct contact with with each other but we're managing for the time being so talking about managing how are you within the business actually on a day-to-day -day basis how are you managing um within the ferrari the lunelli uh, businesses because there's, there's a lot of them and they're in different places how's that all working out well, first thing we did uh, two weeks ago was closing completely the activities who have a, a contact with the public. So our restaurant, Locanda Margon, was the first to be closed even before uh, the, the rule of closing was, uh, came out from uh, local authorities because, I mean, it was risky both for our personnel and for clients. It didn't really make much sense at that time. Then we closed the, the, the activity in terms of incoming uh, of visits to the winery, but we're still, as of today, very active is sending our online, basically, selling. We have uh, a, basically all the, the, the people working in the office working remotely, smart working. We probably have like two or three people just in the winery for or billing or just sending the few, I must say, bottles we're sending now. While uh, on the productive side, the situation is very different because in, uh, in the vineyards, we can continue working without any problem. I mean, we have our director for security and our doctor who are supervising all the procedures we have to take to make sure that the workers do not travel at the same time, that we don't have they don't get changed at the same time. They're spread on the vineyard. So there are a number of rules we had to implement in the, in the vineyards, but uh, operations are continuing without any problems. In the winery, we have a very tough slowdown. So we have uh, less than 20% of the, of the workers on site and uh, uh, with very strict procedures. So, so um, they do not enter all at the same time. We have all the protective measures for all of them. And most of all, I want to underline, all of the workers are doing that on a voluntary basis. Those who felt more better off staying at home are staying at home. So 
we're uh, we're coping for the time being. We're managing well. People uh, feel safe, and uh, we don't have any stress. Uh, but everything will depend on how long this is going to last. And my understanding is to go from one vineyard to another, um, you need permission, or that, that that's not easy in itself. You know, in terms of of people who are looking you, at, uh, over the whole business, is that correct? Yeah, you need a certification and uh, that an auto certification of the reason why you're traveling as of today in Italy. Then, if you're stopped by the police, uh, they have the right to to double check if you're really going that place to work or if you have no reason, you, you get uh, punished. And in terms of communication with customers, you talked earlier about uh, media and so on. In terms of communication with customers, how is that um, continuing at the moment? Mainly online. That's really the, the great uh, resource we're exploiting now. But uh, until uh, probably today, we, we thought this could be quite short term uh, um, perspective, uh, having basically everything stopped. So we chose rather a low profile perspective because we really think that uh, wine is associated with the joy of life, uh, with the joy of getting together. So I think there's also a more intimate side to that, which is I had to renounce to too much. Why should I also renounce to the pleasure of uh, a glass, even by myself, or to, to share with my husband, with a strict family? But still, we preferred quite a low profile of communication for the time being. If the emergency will keep going for many, many months, maybe it will become more active. And uh, are you finding that the, that the people you're talking to are as ready to get into the technology um, required for all this sort of communication as, as you and obviously Lara are? Is that, is that a learning curve for them? I think it's a learning curve for everyone, honestly. But uh, given that uh, most of the population is really familiar with social media, that's really a great um, basis for uh, this direct communication. And everyone is already familiar with that. So can I jump in on that yeah. really quickly? And one of the pieces of data that we've seen is that Italy has got the highest rate of adoption of social media in Europe, but at the same time, one of the lowest rates of adoption of any sort of web-based sales communication. They're just, it's never been a priority for them, as you say, because of relationship building. Do you see that changing in a long lasting way? Will this be the impetus for really what is technology culture change? Well, I think when it comes to online purchase of wine, I think that's going to have a, a long-term impact. Personally, I've never understood why Italians in particular buy a lot more of clo clothes, for instance, online than they buy wine when I think like buying clothes is more complicated. Personally, I want to try a pair of trousers on and maybe I want to try 10 when I get into a store. I don't want to have 10 and then try them on, get them back. I mean, I don't find it very, and I also like having someone to, to suggest me. But for wine, when you find a wine you like, I mean, you don't need to carry heavy. There are so many positive sides to online purchase of wine that it has always been a mystery to me why in Italy it has been so long. Now the numbers we've seen in these weeks is uh, that the, the, the purchase is uh, three times higher than it was before. So it's a huge uh, increase, but numbers are so small that it's very easy to have a huge increase when uh, you start from such a, a small basis. But I think that will probably be a long lasting uh, change of habit. Polly, I think just uh, actually, yeah, but Audrey, I think there's a note from Damien Wilson, which is who's in the audience, um, who's at the University of Sonoma, um, saying he recalls the Italians are the first and most saturated in mobile phone adoption as well. So obviously there's a, there's a potentially a link there. Maybe it's just the Italian need to communicate at all times. Or to just look beautiful. So, Polly, would you like to move yeah, on to, I talk, get to, to talk to Beck? I get to interrogate Beck. 
Hello, Rebecca. I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but hi. Oh, I mean, you do so much. So along with working, you've got, you know, a, along with your, your day job, you have a yeah. balanced class, you have uh, an incredible amount of travel every year, and you speak and present sort of all over the world on issues that are near and dear to you. Mm -hmm. And you have, I know that you work from home, you know, not daily, but year round. So can you talk to us about some of the challenges you're seeing in the U.S.? Do you feel like you're better connected? Do you feel like the wine world is more ready for it? Do you feel like wine businesses are yeah, sure. working harder? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's interesting because if I'm the only, I'm the panelist here, that's kind of the meat and the sandwich between client and producer or client and media. And in, you know, a job as a communications professional, we've been kind of remote because our client base has been remote, you know, for, for years. So we predominantly work with our, um, you know, journalist media influencers via a lot of the technology that's obviously currently being um, used exponentially. So, um, you know, beside working from home, the tools we're using haven't really changed. The frequency is certainly uh, increased. Um, managing working from home as a working with an importer, um, your day never starts or stops. And so from the time you wake up, you're already behind what Europe's done the day before uh, or, you know, what Australia or, or the Southern Hemisphere has been up to. So from a, a professional point of view, it's quite a challenge to, uh, I love um, Laura's concept of the B minus, you know, because I think that's something you, you have to adapt as a way to effectively perform in, in your role. And uh, so I think that from, we've seen digital adoption um, in communications very much um, lapse in the wine category, of course, and there's plenty of conversation about it. I would say, is this a forced time for things to um, catch up? I think so. Um, I think people, certainly producers want to stay connected. Um, you know, again, working between uh, journalists and, and suppliers, but also our own sales team or our own service functions within Folio, there's a real need to be that immediate active link right now more than ever. And I think one thing, and again, in the not getting it perfect, not getting it right. We're in quite this vulnerable space, right? Where no one knows if they're getting it right because there's no known. We, we are in a time where uh, there's a lot of innovation in terms of the way people are connecting, but there's also this forgiveness. And I think, you know, Stevie Kim from Vanitaly said it the other day, you know, this kindness, this need to give each other a little bit of a break in how we're trying to achieve this, this way of, of being. Um, so, you know, I've worked from home or remotely uh, for 10 years on and off. Right now it's, you know, until our recent obviously shelter in place, it was two days a week in an office, which is incredibly helpful for someone in my role that needs to ship samples to journalists to organize remote tastings or to make certain that, um, you know, we're receiving messaging that might need to be done. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of self-discipline, I think. Um, I live on my own. Uh, I don't have an office. This is my office, is my apartment. I live in San Francisco. Um, so I don't have a lot of that discipline of scheduling children or pickups or drop-offs or meal times or, uh, and that's got its own challenges, definitely. Whether that's um, within creating content for a balanced glass or whether that's um, connecting to people for community health care, um, there's, a, there's a lot of its kind of nuanced challenges of this free and single life uh, living alone, uh, particularly now, is, um, is changing. So it's, uh, it's kind of having to retool some things and double down on other things. 
Okay. Do I get to ask her balanced glass questions? You do. Am that I was one. Yes, absolutely. I think. Okay. I think. I think Rebecca's just, Rebecca's just given you open the door for you to to do that. Yay! All right. So you're our panel expert on how we can stay mentally and physically healthy through all of this. Before uh, before we officially started, Beck and I were talking about the fact that I'm working in a one bedroom apartment and I can't get out. I know that all over the world, people are saying we can't get out and be physically fit and healthy. And our, my brain is going. So Beck, how are we, you know, give, us some of, give us some of your <laughs> guidance on this. Yeah, um, goodness. Um, I, you know, I would say, it's it's whatever you're doing for self-care double down and do twice as much right now if you have an ability to meditate you have a meditation practice for five minutes make it 10 if you do a morning stretch when you get out of bed schedule another time to do it self-care for for your, your mental health is more critical now than ever um i think felicity's piece yesterday on mining that i think robert you'll probably speak to um the isolation and the out of routine is a real, real challenge for all of us. Um, whether that means you've moved into a different space or you've just found yourself with right all this free time because we're suddenly not, um, we're not taking that 30 minute trip to get to the gym, to do the workout, to take the 30 minutes home. All of a sudden you have that lack of routine. You have what you're saying, this kind of stiffness in this cabin fever. Uh, it's, a, it's a real, not only physical health challenge, but mental. And the beauty of the, the internet, what we're seeing is, you know, online resources have exploded for mental health and physical health. So we have, um, if you don't have yet an app downloaded on your phone for meditation or breath work, calm, I mean, there's plenty. Headspace and Calm are two I highly recommend just to have them on your phone as a way to to take a break. Um, if you have a physical practice, your uh, gym, your, your workout space probably has, is either converting to or has converted to some online resources, whether that's Zoom live classes, whether that's teacher recordings that you can go back and watch on your computer. Um, I think that's key. I think Stepping away from social and news and screens is more critical than ever in terms of just your, your physical stagnation and also your mental health is really important right now. Um, finding something that you do to um, makes you laugh, right? Finding something that's ludicrously ridiculous. Sorry, I've got a cold um that makes you laugh that brings you joy you know we we live in a work in an industry of pleasure and by the way i do have wine <laughs> thank you damien um but finding pleasure and and camilla you said it earlier finding that time to either have a glass for yourself or with someone else you know i live on my own again I, i'm not sharing glasses with but i open up my hallway and i cheers my neighbor across the hall at our safe distance just to get that physical, mental eye connect. I see you, I see you, I see you're human and we're in this. Um, and I think, I think that's uh, really important. To your point, Stevie Kim uh, on Monday did say, I think one of the good points she said is, just get your coronavirus uh, news once a day. Uh, resist yes. the temptation to check every half hour, every hour and so on, because if whether you're looking for it or not, you're going to see stuff you, that isn't going to make you feel any better. Um, take it in one dose. Is that, is that roughly the way you're, you're looking at it? Yeah, I mean, I would say I, I'm at least twice a day, but I check on other people and ask them how many. I'm, I'm notorious. I call people and I say, how many tabs do you have open on your computer and how many of them are news sources? And I want you to turn them off. Um, and I, and I stick to the, I check at least twice a day for me, but yes, corralling your news into a certain time of day is, is critical. Um, and I'm Laura, I love your recommendation. Lara has a great recommendation of bright day for your posture. Do you want to give a quick? Uh, yeah. So actually I was doing an, a video of an online tasting with a friend of mine. 
and she's Argentinian, he's British, and he actually works for this company, Bright Bay. And I knew this, but I've never tried it. And so he told me how they have this, um, this free uh, coupon for Bright Bay. And I've been trying it on my computer and literally I was having a lot of really bad neck pain and it's gone after two days. And it basically ha puts the camera on you and it forces you to have good posture. And that's one of, I think, the biggest problems of working at home is that you're sitting, like you said, Rebecca, you don't have the little breaks that you normally have. So uh, if you don't do something about your posture, you're going to have really bad neck and back pain. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm loving that. And basically anybody can get it right now for free. Thank you, Laura. I'm going to actually get um, Felicity Carter on board because um, we just heard from um, uh, Beck that uh, Felicity has been um, has written a piece yesterday for uh, Meiniger's in which um, she looked at the, the the psychological effects of being um, in not a serious solitary confinement, but certainly. Um, locked away from people. Felicity, I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, can, you, can you share with us a little bit about what you discovered for that, for that piece you wrote, please? Okay, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, well, I spoke to uh, an expert in isolation called Professor Craig Haney from uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. And he said that for everybody going into lockdown or quarantine or who's working for home, from home for the first time, um, it's extremely important that you understand that you're in a very, very unusual situation that has a psychological cost. Um, that when people are isolated, and this is true even if you're in isolation or quarantine with somebody else, um, that the brain tends to shut down, that the first thing that happens is people get depressed and anxious and they start to question themselves rather than understanding they're in an unusual situation. Um, so second, he said, if you go into quarantine or lockdown, it is extremely important that you understand it's an unusual situation um, and that you make a plan to deal with it. And in, in particular, stick to your normal routine. Get out of bed at the same time, get dressed in your work clothes, whatever they are, have your breakfast at the same time, have your lunch at the same time. Do not take up any habits, particularly around alcohol that you don't normally do. So if you drink at seven o'clock at night, don't start drinking earlier. And the third and most important thing is you need to connect with other people, whether it's through email, whether it's through video conferencing or whatever it is that you do, um, you need to try and break the isolation as much as possible. And I think there was a thing there that, that he said about in terms of working, in terms of a working relationship with other people, um, in terms of working, uh, how does that, that? Yes, um, I mean, he, his area of expertise is working with prisoners um, and, and looking at how prisoners, you know, deal with the very unusual circumstances that they're in. And of course, prisoners are often in very small spaces with other prisoners. And he said, um, uh, if you're sharing a space, even if it's a loved one like your spouse or your children, um, when you're confined together, you will, you know, you will really, really annoy one another. So the most important thing is to negotiate at the start how you're going to do it, how you're going to divvy up work chores, how you're going to divvy up the same workspace, um, and also to give each other a lot of psychological and as much physical space as possible. But the first thing he said, he said, it just, you must be aware that it's a very unusual and stressful situation and you need to plan for it and negotiate with the other people that you're with. You've gone, are you still there? Yeah, can you yeah, hear me? Right. Thank you, Felicity. I think um, it, that is online, isn't it, on the Meiniger's site? Yes, I, it is. I, I recommend anyone look at it. Um, you can, I think if you can see me, there's a line from the New Yorker, which if I move across, I think that may well um, say it pretty well. I'd like to actually now invite uh, Rekha Harris, who's actually in that situation, has been in that situation for a while. Rekha, uh, it's a, you've got a small winery in, in Veneto, and you and your husband have been pretty much um, just with each other for the last what what is two three weeks um can we see you yet we should be seeing you i don't can you know hear me you are. yes we can there you go so reka yeah. how's yeah. it been you've been you've been keeping a diary haven't you an online diary yes and and i have to thank felicity actually for that awesome idea to keep me uh, going and keep my brain working in this situation we're actually concluding our fourth week 
uh, in isolation or shelter in place or quarantine or whatever you want to call it. Um, we were among the first ones to um, have to stay home since February 23rd when school shut down in Veneto. And that's when it all started for us. And that was four weeks ago. So how's it been? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the obvious question I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in these four weeks, a lot of things have changed. So we went from schools and, and gatherings and all those close to complete lockdown to further restrictions of today that um, even for uh, a walk or for jogging, you have to stay 200 meters within your own residency. Um, I, I'm not sure this has uh, also rolled out in all of Italy, but in Veneto for sure. Um, and um, that's, that's where we are. We're lucky to have the vineyards to be able to walk around and go further uh, without meeting anybody. And that's it. Even people that have dogs to walk, they have to stay 200 meters to their, to their home. That's, and, that's very strict. And have you and Pierre, have, to, have you created a new routine for, for your daily, daily working and living? Uh, yes, we did have to create because the kids are home and they're two teenage girls and they went online with online schooling. Their school has been incredibly fast in adapting. So they've, they have a completely new uh, rhythm with the school and they need computers that they, we didn't have enough in the house because they never had to use it constantly for studying. So that has created a little bit of uh, unbal technical imbalance in the house. Uh, that has been resolved. But yes, um, travels, uh, selling, um, everything that happens during the springtime in the wine world is, is completely canceled. So we found ourselves just sitting here and trying to figure out what to do next. And every time we came up with a solution, okay, so let's do this the day after there was a new restriction or two days after a new restriction and all those plans have been all thrown away to the point where we're not planning anything anymore because there's no point in planning now that all of the Western countries are going into the same kind of restrictions that we've been in. So. And, and are you in communication? Are you talking to customers? Are they calling you or is it, I mean, are you, uh, so our first, our first move was to send an email to say uh, when, when, um, when in the news it was big that Italy was uh, having a breakout. Obviously, we felt it immediately. Their customers were a bit worried. So the first thing we did was to send an email um, to them to say that we're, we're, we're doing well, we're healthy, we're not impacted that we are 100 kilometers and 300 kilometers away from the red zones of back then red zones that we're far away. We haven't met with anybody from that area. We haven't traveled through that area. We are good and just to reassure them that everything is okay. And then, and then um, with last week's daily posts and the videos that uh, Pierre and I have done, uh, we received an extremely positive reaction, not only from our customers, but from a lot of other people that started following us because of the daily posting. Um, we had the um, unique situation where Italy was still the only one in lockdown and the rest of the countries weren't. So people were curious to know, how is it to live in that situation? And we were, we were communicating that. Now that's not the case anymore because everyone has gone under lockdown pretty much. So um, we will send out a new email uh, tomorrow to all of our customers to update them that we're still healthy, that we're still okay, we're still in this situation, and we still cannot plan on when they can get the wines from us because the big difficulty at the moment is logistics. Reka, thank you very much for that. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Polly, did you have a question yeah. for Reka? I, I have a question, Reka, because you are a professional brand strategist in wine. Um, and what we're seeing right now is that a lot of wineries suddenly realize that not only do they need a crisis plan, but they need a long-term plan, they need some strategy. Are you seeing more and more wineries now being willing to hear this message? And are you and Pierre using this time 
to develop your ongoing long-term strategies, do you have any advice for wineries? Well, um, I don't see any concise plan yet on a big, um, on a big, uh, in, a, in a bigger um, view or vision. We still haven't received emails from any. No, just one. I'm sorry. Since uh, since that post went out on the buyer, since then only one email hit my inbox from a major Italian or wine organization. Obviously, we're also not very keen in reaching out to to listen to what they have to say. But real communications hasn't come yet. So on a, on a big, if we look at the big world, no, I haven't seen anything just yet. I have seen a lot of really bad communications out there. And that is really, I'm really sorry about that because this is not the time to try to push more sales and be, um, um, let me pass this word, nasty about trying to sell up and reach more and more people to sell more. People's attentions are, is not on buying more wine, but is about survival. And they're afraid, they're panicking, they don't know how to, how to navigate this situation. And that, that's where we need to, to step back and say, let's try to help people first. And then when everything gets back to normal, we can try to sell our products. And this is true for wine and, and for everything else, especially these days since the US has gone, California has gone into lockdown, I've seen a lot of really bad communications and that this is not the time to do that. This is the time to reach out and try to hug your customers and make sure that they know you're here if they need you and, um, and just wait, wait it out. And yes, build brand on long term, think long term at the moment. This is the time that the universe has given us to, to reframe it in a different way. And says so like, okay, now we have this two, three, four, five, eight weeks of time to do it differently. Thank you, Reka. I'd like to ask, um, just taking us away from the, the awfulness of, of the situation we're in at the moment, um, I'd like to invite Gavin Quinney, um, who is a Brit living in Bordeaux, who has actually been through a different uh, situation in a sense with a difficult harvest, but again, having uh, talking to his customers digitally, um, and then, Gavin, are you there? Yeah, hi, Robert. Hi, panel. Hi. <laughs> So how did you, this was how many years ago when you, you basically lost a lot of your harvest? Oh, uh, we've had a few, Robert. We've had a few. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think everybody knows in, in 2017, there was a big frost in Bordeaux. So we lost half the crop in 2017. Uh, 13, we had hail. That was really dreadful. We lost half the crop to hail um, in August. And then 2009. I, I remember you, you you communicated with your customers directly through your newsletter and that, that you, you had a good experience on that. I think so. Uh, I think it was the sort of treat the two imposters just the same. Uh, that's the sort of strategy really. Um, you know, we just let them know what was going on. But you actually got, I think they all signed, you actually told them you had a bad harvest and they actually all reacted well, as I recall. This was a, it was a, a kind of, you went out to them and said, look, this is our problem. Um, and they uh, really sort of rallied round rather than just behaving as customers. Am I right? Yeah, I th I mean, it was, I suppose with, especially the hailstorm back in 2013, that was, um, that was, that was an interesting time. And so sort of communicating with the customers on that was very important, I think. Um, and it's sort of, it, we didn't do it deliberately to get them on our side, but it, that was the effect. And while we're on actually, Gavin, because while we're still talking about selling, about communicating directly, your name came up on Monday because of the way you run your business in the sense you're producing wine in France, um, but you're not selling your wine through an agent in certainly in the UK in the way that other people I think would, would normally expect to do. You're actually selling directly and with a very digital interface with people. Um, can you? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, that's something that we've always done. And in fact, sent an email out today saying our motto of our vineyard to your door has always been the case. Um, 
and that we were still open for business. Um, and so that's been very important to us, having that direct relationship. Mostly, but a, lot of people, but a lot of people don't imagine that's possible. A lot of people think that the only way you can sell wine is through, is through an intermediary. And I'm, I'm interested that you've managed to do it without that. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I think you, you don't. I'm, in a way, I'm a bit like a wine merchant in the UK. Uh, that, I, that's the sort of, I'm importing my own wine in effect. That's not how, it's, how it is really, but um, uh, so we have a small UK business that imports the wine, that's Beauduc Limited, if you like. Um, and uh, so really I'm just keeping the wine in a bonded warehouse and then distributing, distributing the wine from there, um, just like a merchant might do. Um, and that's actually very effective. Uh, and it's not really to cut out the middleman, it's just to have uh, a direct relationship with customers. So, you know, we have a very strong customer base uh, who buy online on our website on boduke.com. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I think that direct relationship, I mean, most people understand why those relationships work. And it's, at the moment, it's, well, my, my, um, my experience is that it's, uh, it has all sorts of issues, but it's not that complicated. Uh, but you do have to have the right way of communicating. And fun enough for us, although I'm um, going to talk a lot of shit on uh, Twitter and, and, and stuff, uh, actually it's really through, through email that uh, we, I send out a monthly newsletter. So that goes out every month at the end of the month uh, without fail. Uh, and then I send out occasional offers, uh, like today, sent out an offer and had um, a really surprise, a, a fantastic response, actually. I was really surprised by uh, how many orders we had. We just had a, a huge amount of orders today. Um, uh, I don't really want to talk about how many, but it was just a sort of, I was just gobsmacked and I'm still looking at the figures now looking uh, really, so maybe people hold up uh, at, you know, up isolated or in quarantine at home, you know, they need wine delivered to their doorstep. And, um, and I'm not, um, I don't want to sound, you know, that's not a, uh, a clever th thing or anything like that. It's just, I think they trust us, they trust our wine and, and uh, we're also, you know, we're pretty good value. We're not at these, we're, we're at the affordable end of Bordeaux for sure. So I don't think really people think of us as Bordeaux. I think it's just, they, they think of, uh, the wine is being pretty decent stuff and, and, and affordable, but they like Thank a direct relationship. Thank you very much. Thanks. I've got a question for the panel from um, Damien Wilson, whose name came up um, uh, earlier. Um, with this panel of wine digital mavens in the same place for a global audience, can I ask what you're all seeing as emerging best practices for wine producers adapting to the new normal of reliance on the virtual environment in this era of residential lockdown. Does that make sense to everyone? So basically, um, what is the best way of, of, of using um, digital and the virtual environment moving forward from here? Who would like to dive into that? Beck, would you feel up for, for that maybe? Uh, Polly is going to, I'm going to move on to Polly in a second. So. No, no, I was just telling Rebecca to, to unmute herself. Oh. <laughs> Beck, do you have something to say? Yeah. Yeah, I think in terms of best practices is, um, comes back to, you know, staying in touch, right? So double down on staying in contact with your customers, which is exactly what Rika um, and Gavin have just been talking about. Take care of your employees if you have, you know, 99% of people here have staff. So I think it's really, really critical to take the time to listen to where your staff are at. Um, it sounds simple, but it often, as people become more concerned about their own well-being, it can tend to, to go by the wayside. And make, find ways to commune, whatever that is for you. And I think that we are a very social industry. We do, like Evan was saying, we are an industry of pleasure and entertainment. I mean, that is a big part of why people love wine. It brings people together and um, it creates community. So, you know, a, a really simple way is just 
create a way that people can see each other's faces, hear each other's voices. And if that's over a glass of wine, if it's the same glass of wine in 30 destinations, fantastic. Thanks, Beck. I'm going to come to Polly in a second about practicalities of working with teams and all this sort of way. But Camilla, Laura, have you got any thoughts on best practice, either of you? Yeah, I can um, make a comment. I mean, I think there is a very big challenge in terms of, you know, you want to support your staff, you know, health comes first. But if you are unable to get paid or sell some wine, you know, at some point, uh, most businesses are not going to be able to continue functioning. So um, what I advise is to have really kind of honest conversations with people to show the, the two sides of the equation. One is first, hey, how are you doing at home? Do you have any older people at your house? You know, how are you coping? You know, like Rebecca said, you know, be, you know, really, because we all care about the people that work with us. And, you know, we've known these people for years and years. You know, I, I have employees that have worked 40 years with our family. Uh, and then at the same time, to be actually quite direct about the situation, you know, uh, sales, uh, you know, some of our importers, uh, half of their revenue comes from restaurants, so they might not be able to pay us. And, and then kind of present to them the challenge of, hey, you're part of our team. Um, how can you help? And I think help is not, you know, like Rika said, is not harassing your, your customers and saying, sell my wine. Uh, you know, but just what are things that we can do to help? Like I, I have an, an, uh, a staff member in London who, who said today, he's going to figure out how he can do home deliveries. And, you know, I don't know that if that's going to be possible, but I, I was just so pleased to hear that, that he wanted to help in whatever way. And he's, you know, a sales guy, but he's willing to do deliveries, to, to walk around London delivering wine, which might be illegal, but, uh, you know, kind of partnering in how to solve, how to move forward. Um, I think that's uh, the best advice uh, that I can give. Thank you for that. Actually, what's the, 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 the guy who's in charge of communications to the Wine Society is doing deliveries um, this week. So there's a lot of people um, turning their, their hand to the bump. Camilla, do you have anything to, to throw into that? Uh, I completely agree with what has just been said. Maybe a point will be to stay close to our customer. If I think of our business in Italy, for instance, because mainly through very small wine bars and uh, and tiny restaurants. Maybe the US situation is different because you have you often have big chains of, of restaurants which are more structured, financially sounder than the single restaurant. But I mean for, for Italian wine bars and restaurants which have, which have been closed already three weeks uh, and it's going to be much, much longer it's really going to be very very hard from a financial point of view so we'll see a number of very small clients who will probably be forced to to close or find some financial solution the government is moving the european union is moving quite fast unfortunately but uh, uh, we'll see a real crisis in, uh, in the sector. And I think we'll have to try and be close to our customers in those, that situation. This said, uh, as Laura um, mentioned, our responsibility is also to keep the business doing, going. We wondered at a certain time if it would have been wiser to just close everything. Mm. Which, uh, but even if our priority was absolutely health of our workers first, we said we have to be rational and work on a long term plan, not just panicking and saying the easiest thing to do is close two weeks because you cannot close six months. I mean, we have reasons for our uh, traditional method of sparking wine for Trento Doc. We have the wine now in the, in the tanks. We need to start with the tirage. We can wait a month, no problem, but we cannot wait six months because we need to, to bottle. I mean, no, no, no doubt about that. And ensure a long-term perspective for our workers, for all the system. So we try to make it as rational as possible, keeping health first, but also keeping in mind we have to, to have the business running on the medium long term. 
Thank you, Camilla. I've got um, Thomas Palekia, who I think is in, if I'm correct, is in Greenland. Is that right, uh, Thomas? Can you hear me out? Okay. Thomas, there you are. Can I, are you in Greenland? Oh no, I was many years ago. Okay, um, you were talking about the, you, you were picking up on Felicity's point about um, the dangers of the business we're in and having alcohol to hand when you're working from home, I think. Yes, I was, I was stationed in the, in the military in Greenland which was considered an isolated location. And believe me, it was. Um, and I did learn a lot about who I am by being isolated. Um, and I learned that I may have been too willing to drink too much alcohol. You gotta watch for those kinds of things. Um, and also, um, someone said, find joy. Um, music is joyful. Get a lot of music, get a lot of it. <laughs> I lived with it, you know, whenever I was in my lonely little room. Um, I'm just relating to that because of we're in this situation now. Thank you very much, Thomas. It's a nice, nice comment to make. So, um, Polly, um, I wanted to say you uh, and your practical advice um, to last, um, because um, I think it's going to be some stuff that a lot of people will want to take away with them. You've been working, uh, as I said earlier, across the world uh, in business terms for a long time. How, what are the tools that you've been using to make that work? Desperation. <laughs> That's Apart the number one tool. That answers the whole thing. Um, so it, it's been really interesting to hear what everyone's having to say. I came to working by remote because I was an expat and it was the only way that I could make money. Um, and also because, you know, really touching on the mental health issues, when I moved to New Zealand in 1998 from Hollywood, California, it was the era of Napster. I'd come from a place where I had connections and a great job and good life and yada, yada, yada. And I lived in this tiny little suburb in, in Auckland. Um, and it really was the thing like learning how to use the technology of remote was what kept me sane and then eventually allowed me to run an agency that really like i i love my new zealand wineries like family but most of my clients are abroad um so i've enjoyed hearing everyone's comments and Robert of course sent out a New Yorker article uh, with some key points on how to work from home and I am going to talk about kind of the personal ones and then the technical ones separately. So from a personal standpoint we heard a lot about the need for communication and I'm going to go a little bit more specific on that and say that it's not only communication but it's boundary setting. Um, there's some very interesting work by a relationship uh, researcher by the surname of Gottman, who talks about, and it was actually quantified into math by a, a English scientist, mathematician called Hannah Fry. I highly recommend reading it if you're watching some YouTube clips about it, if you're working from home. Because what it shows is that uh, relationships that are constantly resetting their boundaries just little by little work healthier in the long term. And this is exactly what it is to work at home with, you know, I, I homeschooled my kids when they were little for a period of time, and my husband also works from home. So we were all up in each other's business. And, and as I can only, about four women, so sorry, I'm going to talk to the women in the group. Really, with your family, I look at my family and I say to them now, if they walk into my office space during my office hours, that unless they're bleeding or dying, that's my office space and they need to respect that. And I am very nice about it, but that's the truth. But also I look at them and I'm like, I want to give you my complete attention, but I can't do that for another 20, 30, 40 minutes. So it's those people who we love understanding that we do want to give them our time and we will do so at the first opportunity but they have to fit into our schedule and our responsibilities as well. Um, other things, this has come up so many times today, routine, 
had routines. My routine does not involve putting on work clothes every day. I'm probably in my pajamas, but like almost to the point of ritual that my day doesn't begin until I've had my coffee and I'm settled into my desk. And then I, I work in the same flow every day. Uh, and some things about that for anyone who is new to working at home. Um, and then I'll let Robert talk. Uh, it's really easy when you work at home to let work become your life. You're always there with a phone and a computer and email and there's no excuse and everybody knows it. So I instituted uh, years back, no contact Mondays. So I don't communicate with my clients on Monday at all because I have a business that has to be run and I have to have time to dedicate to my own, even if it's just getting my car service, just all the things that come into my own life and my own ability to get around, get, you know, payroll and taxes and our own website, all of those things are deserving of my time, just like my clients are. And that's, I make that very clear in a non-judgmental, angry kind of way that just if you email me on Monday, I'm not gonna get back to you until Tuesday. And as Laura said, it's amazing how many Monday morning problems people can solve when they are left to think through it on their own. And, and you know, I think that if you can, if you can block out time, I, I know some people who do it where they don't work Monday mornings and they don't work Friday afternoons, um, that it's just a great practical solution for managing and taking control of a schedule that when you work from home can become all encompassing. So now I think that that's all absolute fabulous stuff, but I need you to come back to the, 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 the nuts tech. and bolts of this stuff. Cause what I don't think anybody, everybody here knows is that what we're doing now would have been completely impossible if uh, it hadn't been for um, Polly's technical um, skills. So essentially you've put all this together. We've been communicating in various ways, sometimes more successfully than others, but you, you use Slack a lot. And our friend Paul Mabray is a, is a great um, believer and lover of Slack. What are the, 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 the tools that you would recommend that people now who are in this new situation who were before maybe relying quite happily on emails and phone and getting around, uh, in terms of talking to an entire team, in terms of running their lives, what are the tools that you'd recommend? Yeah, um, your number one tool, no matter what channel you're using, and this is gonna sound ridiculous, is emojis. Um, it's, it's so hard to lose context. You know, like Laura was talking about the hallway conversation, Slack calls it the conversations you have over the water cooler. When we're in proximity to one another, we can share these ad hoc moments of what's going on in life. They understand where we are in a given space, and I'll kind of come back to that in a moment. So make use of emojis, and Jamie and Good is gonna hate this, but Paul Maybray is gonna love it. Use gifts, yes? I'm just gonna try. I think, Laura, you've got to go for us. I think you've got to leave us. Is that right, Laura? Yes? I can't, hold on, I've got to unmute you because I can't hear you, hold on. Um, yeah, hi, so I actually had a call at noon, but I, how much longer are you going? Because I can be a little late to my other call. I think we're probably good for about five, five, five minutes. Okay, minutes I'll, I'll, I'll stay on because I don't want to miss anything. Every, every piece of information is so helpful. Thank you, we love having you. Uh, Polly, sorry to go back okay, to you. I'm, I'm, I'm under the gun, I got five minutes, all right. Um, important things that you need are invest in a good microphone. I'm not using one right now because I'm on my travel laptop and this was unexpected, but one of the first things that we did was buy good headsets with good built-in microphones. In fact, I work from home uh, on a Rode podcasting microphone, which kind of boom arms up over my desk um, because there's nothing worse, honestly, than not hearing each other speak when you were trying to get work done. Um, the other tools that we use, uh, we have looked at every productivity app on the market. This is an ongoing thing. You mentioned you don't love Slack. 
oh, that's fine. The important thing about a productivity app, and you need one, is that everyone on your team has to have buy-in. If people don't like it, they're not going to use it, and you as a leader are going to get pissed off because you're spending money, and it's a lot, on a productivity app that nobody's using. So get buy-in, however large your team is, on what method you are using. We still really prefer Slack. Another recommendation is going to be do a proper crash course on all the things you can do with Slack because most people underutilize, if that's what you're going for, the various ways. So Google Drive integrations we use, Zoom call integrations we use, uh, internal post we use. Um, in terms of oh, make templates for your life. And this kind of comes back down to the routine thing. We all have jobs that we do over and over and over again. It's much harder to do by remote and you find yourself spending a lot of time recreating those tasks. So whether you're using process documentation, there are lots of ways to do that, um, or something as simple as Excel or Google Sheets, actually just lay out, you know, what does a project look like? Who has ownership of it? Make certain that there is a way for people to, to check the boxes and, and do the things that they have to do so that you're not constantly sending as a leader emails that say, have you done this? Have you done this? Where is it? Can I find this? Because it, it's really about working efficiently. And that is a lot of what you lose when you move into a remote space. The next thing, so am I allowed to get a couple more in? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> don't skimp on your computing. So I know Beck, who I'm going to tease, um, is working on a, a very old computer. And and these this can cause problems. I know not everybody has the money to go out and buy, a, you know, an awesome, huge graphic kind of gaming computer and do it. But this is your frontage to the world make certain that it functions and and when it needs care and updating and maintenance do it so i can keep going but i know that you want to hear well we're going to lose laura if, if, i think we're going to lose you you've got a call to, to 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 take um it's up to us whether we want to carry on for a little bit but um we could i'd like to just chip in quickly with a note from jennifer becker because i do like it whether it's the last thing we do or not which is that she wants to echo the need to the, the, the real balance between keeping a business going by selling wine because we for the sake of our livelihoods and, and our staff and our clients versus the reality of staying empathetic and having restraint with sales messaging and that's going to be i think as, as reka said earlier it's going to be a big challenge for all of us how we communicate and, and we all do different things i produce wine in france i do consultancy as, as, as polly does but we all have to be very aware of, of where our clients and where the people we're talking to um, are in, in their lives. Um, and Camilla, I think you're, you'd obviously be very aware of that in, in, in Italy and, and globally. And just to be fair, Jennifer is, um, I just want to say, Jennifer is a digital marketer in wine as well. So she knows what she's talking about in this conversation. I want to make a quick comment to Polly's um, comment about technology is that I, my son, who is a video gamer, uh, taught me about this ethernet cable thing. And my speed is 20 times better. I have no interruptions now. And I could have done this five years ago and it would have been amazing. So uh, it, getting an ethernet connection is very easy. Just, you just need a cable to your computer and you plug it to your modem and I would highly recommend it. I work off an ethernet as well, same thing, yeah. Yeah, we all rely on Wi-Fi far too much, and I think we, we suddenly, when you do plug your, when you cable in your machine, you suddenly, it's not a machine, your, your, your computer, whatever, can, you see a difference. Can I interrupt with a shout out for a program that most of you are, don't know about, but you should? Um, there's a service called Figma, F-I-G-M-A. It is probably one of the best, uh, like free, if you can get a free plan for it. Um, graphics programs, it was actually made for website mockups, but now people are using it for all sorts of things, including PDFs, including your social media posts. And the free version is brilliant and they have great customer service. So for someone who's just figuring out how to do some of this stuff at home and you don't wanna have to invest a gazillion dollars in Adobe, that's a, a brilliant solution. 
Um, some other options that I just want to mention, if you're looking at things like uh, photos, you need photos for blog posts because that's really the world that we're living in right now. Please remember to go to places that offer images of people who don't look like us. We have a lot of stock uh, photo repos online where you can find beautiful people of all different makes, shapes, and sizes, and many of them even include wine. Um, so, you know, just when you're looking at resources, think responsibly about where those resources are coming from and, and how you can really represent for all of us. I've got a quick question from Lilia uh, Kachatrian, I'm sorry about if I'm pronouncing this wrong, who is uh, in Argentina from Bodega Matavini in Mendoza, which I'm sure you know, Lara. Um, and she said, Argentina is going to lockdown for, for 10 days starting tonight. Luckily, uh, winery workers can go to work. Nonetheless, do you think this pandemic is going to incite a surge in automation of winery operations? Camilla, Lara, any thoughts on that? And, and what, are, what are the implications of that? Um, you're still muted. Well, uh, I, yeah. I mean, I think that there's already automation happening worldwide in farming. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, cost of labor, which is more expensive in some countries than other. Um, I mean, I honestly don't think this thing is going to last long enough for there to be a big change in automation at the winery, because by the time we buy the machine, you know, in Argentina, it takes several months to get a machine. Nobody has the money to buy any machines right now because nobody knows if they're going to get paid. So honestly, I don't think it will change much in the winery. Great. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, Camilla. Yeah, I am absolutely aligned with that. And I think all the automation that could be done, we've worked on that a lot. Like if I think on, on the farming side in the vineyard, there are also some territories like our mountains in Trentino that just do not really allow that a lot of automation. So prices or not, I don't think that will change much, neither was... in the vineyard or in, um, in the cellar. And also timing, as Laura said, probably is not long enough. What I think will change uh, probably on the long term is more on the communication and, uh, and sales side. I think some of us, uh, someone in the, in the industry is, starts to, to wonder, is all that travel really necessary. I, I do think some travel is necessary. It's really important, but there's also an issue linked to sustainability. I mean, all of our wineries are working a lot that we talk about saving CO2 with a number of activities we're doing in, uh, in the cellar and so on. But then we're also all traveling like crazy. And if I can add a personal note uh, to the discussion, a, on isolation, also linking to what Felicity was saying before. Personally, I sometimes I'm traveling so much that now I also appreciate from some points of view being home with my kids because I've never had the opportunity of being home for three weeks with uh, with my children all day. Maybe it's a bit a lot, <laughs> but. Uh, some questioning about all the, the fairs, all the, the events and so on that are taking place will probably last on the long term, I think more than on the, on the productive side. I'm not saying traveling is not important. I'm just, I just think probably this will help us to be a bit more selective on the events and travel and contacts. We, we will Camilla. Have. I think that's very, very well said. Uh, I travel far too much as we all do. And this year is the most grounded I've ever been. And my children would very much like me to um, get on a plane and go somewhere as soon as possible, especially <laughs> since they're now in the house because they're not at school. But um, can I just say we're about uh, 15 minutes over. Um, I'd like to thank everybody um, all of you panelists, I've been very much the, the, the odd man out here, including some of our uh, questions from some of our um, female uh, participants as well, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to all of the nearly around 50 participants who've hung around. Uh, this will, thanks to Polly's um, skills, 
um, end up being a video on YouTube in the next uh, few days as the, the, the previous one has been. And I'd love to continue some of these discussions, some of the questions and so on. Please feel free, uh, participants and everybody else uh, who you talk to, to, to continue this. And I'd like to ask the, the panelists to have a quick look at that occasionally and see if you can chip in as well. But I think that if anything uh, talks to Camilla's point, the fact that we can do this as easily and as apparently successfully as we have for the last hour or so, it does raise some very big questions about some of the, the, the flights that, that we've all been taking. So thank you all. And I think, Polly, I think we're looking at being back again on Monday of next week, doing something else. Um, but thanks a lot. And until next time. Cheers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank